He didn't tell me the number this season, so I couldn't remind him. Uh, so as mentioned in the prayer, Brother Lynn Parker is going to be speaking at this hour. His subject of famine in the land is from Amos 8 and verse 11. He and his wife Mary Ann have five children, plus a whole bunch of cows. And And other animals. <clears throat> he preaches for the congregation at New Bronze Falls, Texas. <laughs> I know I mispronounced it. I have time to. He is a staff writer of Contending for the Faith. And has done mission work as well as speaking on numerous lectureships each year. Uh, he directs a lectureship uh, as well. I think that's in September this year. <laughs> September of this year. It's going to be dealing with practical lessons from Revelation. It's part two. Part one was last year. So, uh, But they always do an excellent job in uh, their lectureship. He's going to be speaking on the great subject, uh, famine in the land, from Amos 8 and verse 11. It is always my pleasure. I really do. I, it's, I consider it a highlight of my year to, uh, to be able to be here with you good folks. And as we look out at the brotherhood and we see the problems that afflict uh, the precious bride of Christ, aren't we made to appreciate even more uh, truth-loving elders like you got here. Preacher like you got here along with his good family that loves the truth and stands for it without apology. Absolutely. The good work that you do and uh, only uh, only eternity is going to know how much good you all have accomplished and continue to. I love it because uh, it's, it's a comfortable place to be. There are some places where you go and, and uh, you may not feel as comfortable, but here you feel like you're back among family, which means that you can uh, then be comfortable saying things uh, then even before the lesson that sometimes need to be said uh, there. And I was just uh, thinking about some of those. I do want to, um, I do want to mention to you right now that uh, my fellow elder back in New Braunfels, Brother Rick Heimberger, is not able to be at the worship assembly tonight because he just took his um, chemo treatment. This is the last one he's got to take for, I think, about a month. But I believe he's watching on the Internet right now, and if you don't know Rick Heimberger, I tell you what, uh, you have missed out. He and his uh, sweet wife, Jennifer, their good family are truly assets and, and uh, jewels. They are. And uh, Rick Heimberger is uh, battling. He's in, a, he's in a fight for his life there with cancer, but he's been doing really well and been making progress. His attitude is great. He continues to do the work of a shepherd as God said uh, it ought to be done. Just an outstanding man. He really is. Would you pray for him? Would you, would you do that? And if, uh, if the Lord wills that his life be extended, that the cancer be beaten, and uh, that will be a blessing not only to us, but I'm convinced to the entire brotherhood. And he's very special to us. Now I want to talk about somebody else that's so very special, and that's Brother Doug McLeish. It's, uh, I, I don't know how else to put it, it, it has pained me this week to see some of the abuse, <laughs> to see some of the abuse that Brother Dove has, has received. Uh, Karen picked me up at the airport a couple of days ago, and one of the first things he told me was that, that people had been teasing him unmercifully about his, um, primarily about his age. And I was thinking about that, and, and um, I want you, to, brethren, to know I'm appalled by some of the comments that I've heard you make <laughs> about Brother Doug McClish. It's pained me deeply. When I think about Brother Doug, I, I think of the Bible. He's a faithful, a faithful proclaimer of God's Word. I, I think back to, the, for example, to the patriarchal period. <laughs> uh, see, y'all just guilty of evil surmising. You're really just laughing right now. 
I, I was thinking back to faithful Enoch, see? <laughs> faithful Enoch. And the fact that Enoch walked with God. Lived to be 365 years old. There. But I was thinking about Enoch's character. I was thinking about Abraham's character. He, he lived to be, Genesis 25, verse 7. Faithful man of God, just like Brother Dove. He lived to be 125, uh, 175. And Genesis 25, verse 8, um, I, was, I was thinking about this. There, as I thought about Abraham, he was of a good old age, an old man and full of years. And as I thought about Abraham and Brother Dove together, I thought of the similarity. <laughs> See, there y'all go, uh, go again. Y'all are doing this. And I'm having no part of it. Y'all, every, every one of y'all will be ashamed of yourself right now. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7, I, I think of Moses when I think of, of Dove. Of course, Moses was over 100 years old when he died. Um, Joshua 24 and verse 29, the son of Nun. Joshua, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And I think of people like Joshua. They're moving forward in this dispensation. So I was just thinking about that. Somebody left on my seat there. Uh, it does not have a name attached to it, but it's just a little poem. It was right over there before I got up. The last day of lectures, you must start on time because the nursing home, home told Doug to check back in by nine. <laughs> And I thought that was rude. I really did think that was rude. So I wrote, I wrote a poem in rebuttal to it just very quickly, just kind of scribbled it out. And I hope, uh, Doug, that you'll take this exactly as it's meant in, in support of you. And I told him earlier today, I have your back. His eyes may have grown dim. Some teeth may be missing. But when Doug talks, we all try to listen. His voice may falter. He may wheeze when he talks. His stride is much slower. And he stumbles when he walks. He could still tie his shoes with help from LeVon and ask about the 1950s and he goes on and on and on and on. <laughs> ask him about his childhood. He'll gladly share it all. First hand him his prune juice so he can take his chair tall. <laughs> to all you pranksters, have you no shame? You've picked on a brother and slandered his good name. Yes, he moves awfully slow and a load he can't carry, but with friends like some of you, he needs no adversary. <laughs> he was a great preacher back in the day. We'll give him his due and one all say, the insults must stop. And while the smoke finally clears, let's all encourage Doug now in his twilight years. <laughs> all right. And I appreciate the uh, I appreciate you, brethren, for wanting me to, to stand up there, Michael, and others uh, there in behalf of Brother Doug. And I hope the rest of you stand corrected, okay? All right. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about Amos and uh, famine in the land. Well, I tell you what, I, I don't know that you can uh, get much plainer than the preaching we heard a little while ago with Darrell Broke. So many great sermons have been delivered, but I appreciated uh, one more there with, with Darrell presenting that. I look at uh, Amos, and I, as I read through the book of Amos, even though it's not very long, I see America. I, you can't help but see it. I, I, I see right there a time when they were very affluent. You're saying, well, the economy is bad. We're not that affluent. Still, compared to most people on the face of the earth, we're very rich. We're very rich indeed. And so while we then take for granted so many things that are at our disposal, you're going to go back through history's lessons, and you're going to see ancient Israel, and you're going to see Amos coming on the scene. If you're looking for a golden-throated after-dinner speaker, you're not going to find him in Amos. Instead, you're going to find someone who comes in, and if words are like a sword, he starts swinging, and he throws away the scabbard, and he tells everybody exactly what they need to hear. And I agree with what was said earlier a couple of times during this lectureship. That is, that your best friend is someone who's going to try to save your soul, even if it means he hurts your feelings. And that's exactly what Amos is concerned about here. He wants to make sure then that he tells them the truth. Whenever you look at this, you're going to see several lessons. I'm not going to try to go back over the background of Amos. You do that for yourself. You study on that. And look at the background because it's, it's absolutely pertinent. It's essential that you get that down. But I do want to talk about the lessons very quickly from the book of Amos. And what you're going to see, first of all, is that all men everywhere are under law to God. I know that we've got so many brethren that believe, well, now look, 
Christ's marriage law just does not apply to everyone. And it doesn't apply to everyone because not everyone is a Christian. And since not everyone is a Christian, they're not amenable to the law of Jesus Christ. And you can't then expect people who are not God's people to obey God's law. Amos didn't know anything about that, did he? Amos didn't because instead you're going to see that he rebukes some heathen nations round about. For example, in Amos chapter 1, starting in verse 3, for three transgression of, uh, transgressions of Damascus, gave for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. You're going to see that uh, he's got a whole Syria responsible for transgressions. Sin is a transgression of the law. First John chapter 3 and verse 4 tells us. And so with that in mind, we're going to see that as he rebukes heathen nations for sin, for transgressions, they were under law. If they weren't under law, there would be no sin because if there's no law, you can't have sin. You can't have transgression. But they were under law to God. Mark it down and underscore it. All men everywhere have always been under law to God. All men everywhere are under law to God today and have an obligation, first of all, to know what God says and secondly, to humbly submit to the will of heaven. Every single person. That's one of the lessons that we can glean from Amos. You're going to also look at Amos, and I mentioned to you that you're going to see America. You are. You're going to see a sin-sick, nasty, nasty nation. You are. You're going to look at some of the things that they do and some of the things that were occurring in ancient Israel, and you're going to hold it up against the daily newspaper and say, I can see some of that same stuff occurring even yet today. How deep had Israel sunk? How far had Israel gone in uh, all sorts of sin? Well, the Bible is going to record Amos chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, several things there. Three transgressions of Israel, yea, for four. I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have sold the righteous for silver, the needy for a pair of shoes, they that pant after the dust on the earth, on the head of the poor, and turn aside the way of the meek, and a man and his father go in unto the same maiden to profane my holy name. And they lay themselves down beside every altar, upon clothes taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink wine of such as has been fine. Now, among other things, you're going to see they neglect the poor. And you're going to see that they oppress people then who are unable to fight back. It is the mark of a wicked nation. It's the mark of a sorry, degraded people, culture, whatever you want to, however you want to style it, when folks look at those that cannot defend themselves and take advantage of it. And whenever you look at America and you see the same thing occurring, you're going to understand that the moral fiber, it's broken, it's torn, it's hanging by just a thread if the thread is still there. But not only that, you're going to see that a father and his son go, on, go in unto the same prostitute. Now, could it be back in that day that they wanted then sexual um, uh, stimulation here that was always something new and novel. I'm not going to try to get very graphic here, but I do want to point out something. That in our nation today, among not only the homosexual community, but also the community of those that believe fornication is just fine and dandy, there is then this seeking after excitement. That's one of the reasons why sexually transmitted diseases have been spread so quickly and pose such a great threat not the least of which, of course, is they're violating the will of God. But then secondly, it's because of this. It's because it's not enough. It's never enough. There's got to be something new and novel. Can we sin in some new way? Can we defile ourselves in another way here? Can we think up something where more people are going to see and more people are going to watch? And I don't mind telling you, in law enforcement, I've made arrests a couple of times for people for what we call in Texas public lewdness or for them committing lewd acts in public for having uh, sexual relations in public. And sometimes it's several people involved in the same thing. And I have arrested someone for bestiality before. You said, oh, that's only Old Testament type. No, no, no. That's in Texas too. Yes. And other places. These type of things. Well, that's, we don't really like to talk about that. Well, because we don't find that comfortable to talk about, doesn't mean that the immoral, hellish, ungodly minds don't mind talking about it. They do. They revel in that. And they say, what else can we do? What else can we do to have a, have a greater fever-pitched excitement? And so they act like barnyard animals. They really do. 
they believe themselves to be uncontrollable and that's the way they act and that is in so many um, so many areas right now that's our nation I teach around young people and I hear the things that college students say one to another before classes start and I can tell you that people don't blush nearly as much as they did say 20 years ago people are not nearly so ashamed of things that they've done and they don't mind having frank discussions even out in public about their many sexual escapades and all their different events of immorality why is that doesn't it sound like they're just like Israel of old sin is progressive sin is and so when a person starts down a road of sin he wants more and more and more of it and that's the way it is with sin 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 captures I can control sin no you can't the Bible is going to teach us that sin hardens the heart Hebrews chapter 3 and that's why we're to exhort one another day by day so long as it is called today lest any one of us the Bible is going to go on to tell us lest any one of us be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin and so you go further and further down that road of sin. I hope young people are listening right now. You young people need to understand something. Surely it's applicable to all of us regardless of age, but especially young people need to understand something. When you choose a life of sin, it starts with one act of sin. It starts with, I'm going to make the wrong choice. I'm going to do the wrong thing. I'm going to go off into sin, but I'm only going to do it. I wonder how many people have said this. I'm only going to do it this one time. I'm only going to go this far. And somebody rightly said, sin takes you a lot farther than you wanted to go. And it requires a price a lot higher than you wanted to pay. And that's what sin does. Well, you're going to see that they found out about that. In Amos chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, you're going to see that the people had then looked at two different classes of people that should have stood out for righteousness in ancient Israel. The Nazarites and the prophets. And they basically gave the Nazarites wine to drink, but the Nazarites weren't supposed to then have anything, anything processed at all from the grape. They weren't to do that. And the prophets were, were supposed to be mouthpieces for God to say exactly what God wanted said to the people. And so how would you defile them if you were a wicked nation? You say, Nazarites, go ahead and drink. And prophets just don't say anything. Prophesy not. What a great lesson we heard earlier uh, then. Uh, before today on prophesy ye not and so that's exactly what they were saying during these particular days the spokesmen for God had become yes men <laughs> they were folks who, who basically when told to us they, they said okay alright that, that'll be fine and sadly and tragically among the other reasons that the church is in the sad shape it is in so many places is because yes men stand in the pulpits and they get up and they know that their their job is not going to be safe if they preach the whole counsel of God. And so because they are afraid, they're nothing but just yellow backed cowards, they then give in to weak membership, says we don't want to hear the truth on this subject or this subject or this subject or this subject. And so the church then just it drops down into this this shallow spirituality. And so many elders allow it to happen. They do. And that's what happens to the Lord's church in so many congregations. You're going to see also in the book of Amos a call to remember. And as you look, you're going to see that God has called those people then to remember the things that He has done for them. If you look at this, you see in Amos chapter 3, starting in verse 1, hear this word that Jehovah has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up out of the land of Egypt, saying, Ye only, or you only, have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will visit upon you all your iniquities. What did he do? He was talking to people who had backslidden. He was talking to people who had fallen away. And he said, Don't you know who you are? He was calling on them to remember. I believe it was McGarvey that said that memory is the lever to repentance. And when we think about memory, oftentimes in the Scriptures, people when they've left the Lord and left faithfulness are called to remember where they once were. And to one congregation addressed by the Lord through the penman John there in the book of Revelation, remember from what great heights you have fallen. Don't you remember where you were? 
And so, brethren that fall away need to be called on to remember. Remember the love of the Lord. Remember your determination to serve Him without compromise earlier. Remember these things. And go back and do what you need to do. Remember where you were at one particular time. Now, get back there. You know the road back. You're going to see that false religion is dealt with in the book of Amos. Uh, Israel had not completely ceased to worship the Lord God. Not completely at this particular time. What you are going to see is that they had added false gods to their worship. And so when you read the fourth chapter of the book of Amos, you're going to read this statement starting in verse 4. Come to Bethel and transgress. To Gilgal and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened and proclaim freewill offerings and publish them. For this pleaseth you... O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord Jehovah. Did you hear that? You come on, do, do this. This is what you want to do? Alright, then come on down here and multiply your transgressions. Stack them one on top of the other. And if it makes you happy, then go ahead and you offer these sacrifices. The clear meaning was that God didn't accept it. He was not going to accept in their adulterated worship. He wasn't going to accept their lifestyle, the conduct. It said, I'm going to meet there. It would be the equivalent of folks today saying, it's Sunday morning, I'm going to be there in my pious best around the brethren. Oh, how I love Jesus! And then they cuss, and they are worldly, and they forsake the assemblies, and they never open the Scriptures, and they don't pray, and they don't live as a child of God is supposed to live throughout the week. Hypocritical. Hypocrisy. Absolutely. And that's what you're going to see in ancient Israel. That's what you're going to see in the Lord's church and spiritual Israel today. You're going to see a message also that serves as the title for one of our songs. I believe it's in this book too. Or probably Prepare to Meet Thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. And as you look at it, you're going to see in Amos chapter 4, verses 6 through 12, that there are about five times in, in the old American standard here, about five times you're going to read these words, yet ye have not returned unto me. Now, each time God has prefaced this through the prophet with what he has done. I've destroyed your crops with mildew and blasting. Anybody that's a farmer knows about that. Anybody that's got an orchard knows that you can get a, a crop failure. We had about 90 peach trees up until just last year. And over 60 of them are now dead. And that because of cotton root rot. Cotton root rot. I didn't know anything about cotton root rot a few years ago. I do now. I do as I saw them falling over. I saw that you can lose it. What if your entire livelihood depended on that? What if your feeding your children depended on having these trees and, and your crops? This was an agriculturally based society and so then God said, look, He said, I tried to get your attention this way. Look at what you have done to yourself. I withheld rain. Well, you know what that means to a gardener, to a farmer. We're in the midst of a drought there in Central Texas. I can tell you right now, cows are getting awfully bony out there in the field. And that grass that should be green is just a crispy brown. I withheld rain, and you haven't returned unto me. And he goes on to say, Your young men I have slain with a sword, carried away your horses. I have made stench of your camp to come up even into your nostrils. Yet you have not returned unto me. I have overthrown cities among you, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye were as a brand plucked out of the burning, yet you have not returned unto me. Saith Jehovah, Therefore, Okay, you see that? The therefore, based on all that I've done and you ignored me, I tried to get your attention. I tried to get you to repent. And you spurned my loving reminders, my rebukes. And so, therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. This was not so much a, at this particular point, a, okay, repent and get ready. It was, you had opportunities and reminders to repent. Now you get ready. God's wrath is coming to you in judgment. It ought to scare people whenever they then understand, and that's part of our job to help them understand, to warn them. But it ought to scare people when they then are shown the Scriptures and they're made to understand from the Word of God exactly where they are. Please understand that our God is a God of love. 
we say that. It's been preached here from this pulpit during the lectureship. The Bible teaches that God so loved the world. John chapter 3 and verse 16. We know that the goodness of God leads to repentance. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. The Bible teaches then that God gave His Son on the cross. Romans chapter 5. And that because of heaven's love commended toward mankind. Now, seeing that God has done everything He needs to do to make a way of escape from sin and its consequences available to every one of us, seeing that God has granted to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, spurn the invitation of God. Spurn the preparation that was made. Spurn the, the giving of His Son upon the cross. Then what have you got left? You have nothing left but the unmitigated wrath of God to be poured out full strength in judgment. And that's it. That's it. You squandered the opportunity, dear friend. You failed to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You trod underfoot the Son of God and you're going to meet the wrath of the Father in judgment. You are. The Bible teaches that. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 and following. Vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And so the Bible teaches then that just as God was going to bring judgment upon Israel, God is going to bring judgment on those that don't obey the gospel. Those that obey the gospel yet fall away and leave their first love. When a person does this, understand you then, and you have to, you say, why is hell so bad? Why is God's wrath, why is it going to be so mighty, so overwhelming? You have to look at it in view of all the preparation and all that heaven wants to do to see you go to heaven, see you be saved eternally. And you have to say, look at all this. Look at the magnificent sacrifice that's been made. All right? Shove it all aside and see what you've got in judgment. No, don't, don't do that. That's not a recommendation. That's simply then a conclusion. What happens when you don't take advantage of the opportunity, God's grace, His love, His mercy, His pardon that's offered to mankind? Then you've got God's wrath. And that's all you've got left. You've got an eternity apart from God, an eternity then in hell. Unless you keep going through here, you're going to see God's plumb line also mentioned in Amos chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood beside a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And Jehovah said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by any more. And I don't think that we have to go into great commentary on that. It's easy to understand. Please understand this, that God measures His people. He always has. God's looking at the church. He's looking at this congregation. He looks at families. He looks at individuals. Where do we stand in the sight of God? It ought to be then a constant, constant reminder to us as we look back then at the prophet's message to ancient Israel and see that God wants us to know He's watching. I'm going to set a plumb line here. Now, I'm not a great builder. I'm really not. I'm not a fantastic carpenter. I can measure a board three times and come up with three measurements. <laughs> and I'm not bragging. That's not an achievement. Okay. But I do know this, that when you set that plumb bob there, you're doing it so that you can make a wall. If you're doing some masonry, you want to make that wall straight. Make sure that it doesn't lean one way or the other. And so God is going to set a plumb line amidst His people. He is not going to then overlook sin. He's not going to in the church. Do not underestimate sin's consequences, the hideousness of sin. Don't ever try to then just basically look at sin and say this is Pollyannish. No, no, no. Don't do that. That would be fatal to your soul. Then you're going to see in the book of Amos that weak leaders want weak preaching. I don't think you find a better example of a noble proclaimer than you find in Amos. And Amos was one that had some opposition. Every single gospel preacher that is worth his salt at all, at least in the sight of God, is going to have opposition. The devil's going to make sure of that. The Bible says, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. So it's not necessarily a compliment that everybody likes you. It's not. Sometimes the best compliment and the best way to be able to tell who's faithful is to see who's arrayed against them, against that person. And you can tell a lot by those who have arrayed themselves against the faithful as the enemies of the faithful. So they declare themselves, don't they? They show themselves. They show their true nature, their true character. Well, there was a man named Amaziah. He was the resident 
um, church member. No, not church member. He was a resident uh, priest there. And he has a message. He was down in Bethel. And he wanted Amos to hush. And this church member, no, I mean this prophet, he says, Amos, you need, to, you need to stop preaching these things or go someplace else and preach them. And I, in my own mind, it's like in Amaziah, if they'd have had a, a U-Haul dealership there in Bethel, he would have gone and paid out of his own pocket and rented a U-Haul and taken it to Amos's house. And early in the morning, Amos would have gone out there and there would have been a map taped to the steering wheel and the keys and, and basically said, Amos, leave. All right? Go. Uh, and if you need help packing, we'll be over with boxes. And that type of idea. My wife used to say this. She said that uh, in previous years that she had learned one great lesson as a preacher's wife. And somebody fell for it and asked her just recently, what was that? She said, never throw away a good box. <laughs> never throw away a good box. Why? Because you may need it. And if you're going to be like Amos, if we're going to be like Amos, if we have any choice in view of a coming judgment, if we're going to be like Amos, then we're going to have to say, here's the truth. And I don't mean to be rude or unkind or ugly, but I really don't care if you like the truth or you don't. Here it is. And we're going to preach it. And it's going to be preached in this congregation, whatever congregation that is. And you folks that want to go to heaven, you're going to support the truth and you're going to appreciate me preaching it or you preaching it or you preaching it. And you folks that want to go to hell, you're not going to like anything that I've got to say. Amen. And we're going to have to have some people that have backbone willing to do that in congregation. We do. We've got some people here like that. We've got a lot of others so that are just like Amaziah. Amaziah came and said, Don't prophesy here. Amos chapter 7, verses 10 and following. Amos, thou seer, go flee thou away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it's the king's sanctuary. It's a royal house. Leave now. Uh, get on out. It's time for you to go. And Amos essentially told him, you know, if you didn't like what I had to say to the king, you're really not going to like the message I got for you, Amazon. And so you think that was too tough. Let me tell you something here. Here's what's going to happen. Amos chapter 7, verses 14 and following. Your wife's going to be a harlot here in the city. Your sons and daughters, they're going to die by the sword. And you're going to see the land divided. You yourself are going to die in a land that's unclean. And Israel's going to be led captive out of their home. Whoa. And so, I've got Amos's resume right now. We're going to send it to everybody that's looking for a preacher, let's say, in the one ads of Christian Chronicle. <laughs> oh, Amos wouldn't get too many calls, would he? No, he wouldn't. Because brethren don't want that. It's just, it's just a matter of... So many congregations, elderships, and, and members in pews, they're playing a game. I mean, this is, it, it might be a little bit more important than the Rotary Club, but it's just a big game. Don't make me mad. Give me a little bit of church. Let me let me pinch a cracker and drink some grape juice. And I have been church for the week. Give me my check mark. And I want to go on and live like I want to. It's just a big game. They're playing church. Let's pay the light bill. Let's keep on meeting. No wonder the church is in such sad shape in so many places. And then you're going to see that Israel was like a basket of summer fruit. The sun has been getting hot, and generally there at the farm, we don't go out and uh, we don't go out and work from about 11 to 4. Uh, there, it depends. I, I told the kids since I was going on over here, and I was not going to be with them that they could go on out and work all day long in the field if they'd like to, and I'm sure they did. <laughs> <laughs> not. Um, but if you take any of the fruit, you pick the tomatoes or the black-eyed peas or anything else, those things that are they're getting ready, and you leave them in the sun for just a little while, they're going to be ruined. Israel didn't have much of a future. A basket of summer fruit, overripe, ready to spoil. That was the case right there. They should have been trembling. They should have been brokenhearted. They really didn't care. And then it brings us, lastly, here at the end of the lesson, to a famine in the land. But I can summarize this fairly quickly. You're going to see, behold, these words. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord Jehovah, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor thirst of water, but of hearing the words of Jehovah. Amos chapter 8 and verse 11. Several years ago, a brother um, wrote in a bulletin 
He said, God never gives up. And uh, that's just not true. That's not true. In Romans chapter 1, you're going to see this in more than one statement there. God gave them up. If a person is intent on doing the wrong thing, God will allow the person to continue on in that squalid uh, path that He's chosen. That sorry, degrading path. God's going to allow that. And so there's a famine in the land. We don't want to hear the truth on this. God said, okay, then I'll steal the mouths of the prophets. If you don't want to listen, I'll stop. I'll stop the loving rebukes. I'll stop the admonishments that are calculated to turn you back because I care so much about you. It would be like young people, you say, well, I don't want to hear what my parents have to say. Really? Really? Is that really the way you feel? You don't want to hear then the loving rebukes saying, if you do this, it's going to hurt you. It's going to, it's going to cause you then some pain. It's going, to, it's going to bring heartache and tragedy to you. How do we know that? Because we're, we're getting older. And because a lot of us have already been there. And, and voices of experience. And sometimes we've done some stupid things, but it's made us smart and we've learned from it. We don't want you to make the same stupid mistakes, especially if it's a matter of sin. We don't want you doing that. We don't want you to bring the consequences of sin down upon you. We don't want that to occur to you. But sometimes people then just will not listen. Uh, I, I, I thought about this, and I'm not sure exactly how to express it. I was thinking about this right before I got up to, to speak. You know, in our society today, we've got a place. When people make a mess of their lives, we've got a place for them. We do. When people make a spiritual mess and refuse to clean up their own mess or, or allow somebody else to help clean them up, God has created a place for them too. And the two places I have in mind are jail and hell. And I tell people in the classes that I teach, and, and one of the classes deals then with police systems and things like that. We have police here because some people don't play nicely in society. It's like a big sandbox. And some people don't know how to behave themselves in there. And when they don't, society finally says we've had enough of that and we want somebody to come clean it up. And I will come clean up your mess. I will. And I've got a place to clean up that mess and, and to get those type of people away. And the Bible teaches that there is a time when God is going to take those that have made a mess of their lives. And we're not talking about people that couldn't have done better. We're talking about people that just spurned God's Word. People that look at the will of God and they say, I really don't care what God has to say. And, and God's got a place for you. And He's got a time when there's going to be a great separation. And so you look at the book of Amos and you see a famine in the land. And I'll tell you just in closing then, uh, some ways that you can have a spiritual famine. I'm not encouraging us to do this. But if you want to have a spiritual famine, here's how to do it. Number one, I'm going to go through these so quickly, you're going to think I'm the cartoon character of the flesh. Okay, here it is, number one. When you fail to train the next generation in the ways of God, you're guaranteeing a spiritual famine. You are. I wish every single person, I, I'm serious about this, I mentioned this to somebody else today, and I've read this sermon so many times, I've about worn out the pages. Uh, in the book, Shall We Know One Another in Heaven by Guy in Woods, he's got a sermon called Profiles in Apostasy. I wish every single brother and sister, young person, old person, parent, elder, Bible class teacher and preacher, if you hadn't already read that, I wish you would go and you would read that sermon. I wish you would. And one of the things he notes is this. Why are we in the shape that we're in in the Lord's church today? Look back at ancient Israel. If you'll look to the closing chapters of Joshua, you're going to see that the people in the days of Joshua were faithful to God. And in the days of those that were contemporary with Joshua, they remained faithful to God. But when Joshua died, and that generation that had been directly influenced by Joshua died, you're going to turn your about one page in your Bible to Judges 2 and verse 10, there arose another generation that knew not the Lord. Brother Woods has some great insight on that. He said one generation passed it on to the next, but then this generation did not pass on the same great truths, at least not with the same enthusiasm and zeal and passion to the next one. We've got to raise up a generation of warriors. Well, I don't want my children to have to fight in the Lord's church. Why? Why not? After I'm dead and gone, I hope, I hope before my God that my five children will stand up and be counted and have a voice for righteousness and will be warriors, soldiers in behalf of Christ Jesus. Yes, I intend to raise up another generation of warriors. I do. I want them to fight. I want them to know the enemy. I want them to know the enemy's tactics. I want them to know about false doctrines. 
So we're down there sometimes milking a cow, and I've got a captive, I've got a captive audience. Not only a cow, but I've got the cow milkers right there. And we talk about those. Let me tell you about one of the saddest events that occurred in my life, just profoundly sad, just a few years ago. Right after 2005, my son named Garland, named after Garland Elkins, a man that uh, served somewhat as a mentor to me, a man that's very dear to my heart. And we were talking about some decisions that Brother Garland has made, decisions that are very evident to all. And my Garland told me at that time, just out of the blue one day out in the garden, we were talking, we just got off the tractor. Dad, why am I named after a man who doesn't stand up for the truth? And so I took his question and I put it in a letter. I sent it to Garland Elkins in Memphis, Tennessee. And if Brother Garland gets an opportunity to listen to this, I'm still waiting for his answer. What am I supposed to tell my Garland? I gave him an answer. I said, as far as I knew, when we named you then after Garland Elkins, he was a man of principle and character. And he was a man then who would stand up just like the prophet we're talking about right, right here tonight. Something happened. Oh, something happened. Something tragic. And I'd hate to think in the twilight of my life that for compromise or for prejudice or bias or political reasons or comfort that I change what I'm preaching just to suit some brethren and pay for some magnificent edifice and a library named after uh, then a, a great preacher of years past just because we need the money. Is that what it is? Is that what it is? Or, or would it just disrupt too much? Or am I too old to move on? Or has he just gotten too old there? And we've kind of joked with Brother Doug about this. You know, has he gotten to the point where he doesn't want to fight anymore? Is that it? What, what's wrong? What's happened? Fail to train the next generation to be spiritual warriors. You'll make sure that we've got a spiritual famine. You're going to see something else. Emphasize material things in the land, and you're going to have a spiritual famine. I promise you, in Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 18, neither your silver nor your gold will be able to save you in the day of God's wrath. Revelation 18 and verse 17, in just one hour, so greater riches are brought to naught. We brought nothing into this world. It is certain that we will carry nothing out. Some brethren just don't believe that, do they? They don't. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 7 and following. Charge them that are rich in this present world that they be not high-minded nor have their hope set in the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And the Bible there, 1 Timothy chapter 6, that was verse 17, the Bible is setting forth here this great principle. Don't you emphasize material things or you're going to have shallow, shallow generations and you're going to guarantee a spiritual famine. We've got so many brethren who are more concerned about t-ball and new cars and clothes and swooshes on tennis shoes than they are the names of the Bible. It's not funny. I'll tell you something that's really not funny. Whenever I go some places and I get to see young people who don't pay attention in worship, who are so, so calloused and careless in the way that they conduct themselves, so disrespectful toward the uh, worship of the Lord, sometimes we see then young people who, who are the products of worldly and material, uh, materially minded parents. And they don't care about spiritual things. And Bible study is nothing more than grab the Bible in the back dash of the car. What are we studying this morning? Hurry up, we're almost to the church building. What were we supposed to do? We had a memory verse. We had something to fill out. I don't remember what it was. That was a week ago. And that's the extent of what we're giving to God. Is it because we've crowded out true spirituality with too many things? There's not going to be a joystick in eternity. We live in a joystick society. I'm, I'm told that there because my students seem to like that. You know, the Game Boy, this and that. And my kids bought me an Xbox for Christmas. And I have yet to be able to figure that out. I won't play with them. And I don't mind telling you, every time I play football with Garland, he beats me badly. And I keep on saying, well, wait just a second. Let me learn to move this thing. No, Dad, you've got to move this one while you're moving this one and punch this one at the same time. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. But I'll tell you one thing. Whenever those type of activities rob us of true spirituality in the home and we become materially minded, we're guaranteeing a spiritual famine. When you want congregations to entertain rather than edify, you're headed for a spiritual famine. Do you get these calls, Michael, sometimes? What does the Bellevue congregation have to offer me? We're moving in. And I don't mind telling you, we get those calls to New Braunfels quite often. People say, well, do you have a youth director? 
No, we don't have a youth program. Well, what's your youth pro program? Well, we've got faithful parents, and, and they get together oftentimes with young people to encourage them, but at work of the church, no, no it's, it's not. But we have plenty of activities then for young people that are Bible-based. We've got good Bible classes. We encourage them to learn, and we expect them to. But the other thing we do when we get those phone calls, invariably, I will ask this question every single time. By the way, what do you offer to the congregation? Should you come and place membership, and should we decide we want you here? <laughs> I'm, ser I'm, I'm dead serious, brethren. I'm not joking about that. That's not just for lecture. I ask that question when they make that call. What are you going to bring to the New Braunfels congregation? And almost every single time, there is stammering and stuttering, and the conversation is ended. Well, uh, I'll have to get back with you on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you will. I'll be waiting for the phone call. Okay. Well, you think about all these things, and then lastly, we'd say if you want to have a spiritual family, remove power from the pulpit. Just start getting people pleasing preachers, folks that make make happen. Wouldn't it be great? If you could walk into a congregation and the brethren say, don't preach to please any single one of us. Just preach the Bible and that's what we want to tell you from the men's business meeting. And you would have some preachers maybe in this room here that fall over. They kill over and grab their chest to your heart attack. What did he say? Did they really mean it? And of course, when you go for that interview or the tryout, you know, it's like kind of like cattle being run through an auction ring. But when you go there... And you ask the question, will you, brethren, stand for the truth? And, and, and have you ever heard anybody say, no, you know, we don't stand for the truth here. As a matter of fact, we're, we're off in error on quite a few, a few subjects, uh, quite a bit of error we tolerate here and expect from you. They can say that. Oh, yes, we love the truth. Oh, really, do you? You're going to allow us to preach the truth on divorce and remarriage? Well, no, I, just, I, I meant to talk to you about that uh, separately. We've got some people in questionable marriages here. Uh, what about denominationalists? Well, we've got quite a few friends of, of our members that are in denominations, and we really don't want the names of any denominations called here. You know what I mean? We'd rather them just kind of assume that possibly, perhaps, we might have them in mind. Can you preach like that? Can you preach like that? I mean, can, can you do that standing on one foot while, you know, while the temperature outside is under 70? All these stipulations. And when you, when you want preachers to do that... If, you, if you're listening on the internet and that's what you want a preacher, you're on the way to hell. You, you do know that. Sure, you know that. You don't. But you do now. You're on your way to hell when you say, I want the preacher to preach weak sermons. I want him to, <coughs> to be a people pleaser. I want him to be generally accepted. How about if you just say, we want you to preach like the prophets and the preachers that we read of in the Old and New Testaments and like Jesus Christ did. I bet you won't find any... I don't, I don't bet there, but I, I, you won't find that type of advertisement in the Christian Chronicle, will you? Wanted. A preacher who will preach just like Amos. Preacher like Jeremiah. Preacher like Paul. Preacher like Peter. Pre preacher like Jesus Christ. And if you'll do these things, if, if you'll preach that message, we'll be happy with you here. You're not going to find that there in that particular uh, magazine or, or periodical. Israel eventually was wiped off the map by an invading Assyrian army in 722 B.C., never to return again as a nation. And Israel was affluent. They were conceited. They were immoral. They were stuck on themselves, absolutely, just as America today is. We have learned some lessons here. One of the great lessons, look back at these people. I wonder how near to the top of the container America's iniquity is. Is the cup of our iniquity full? Is it almost there? Does it need a couple more drops? A couple more years? One more generation? I don't know. I don't know. I do know this. That when a nation's iniquity cup gets full, God deals with it. And I do know the path that we're on. And I also see this, or I wonder this, how much longer will America remain before God finally says enough, we're going to take this nation down? And what about faithful congregations? What, what about congregations out in the brotherhood right now? Are, are they going to remain true? Are they going to stay stalwart? What's going to happen? You know, I don't like to think about this, but what happens when the current elders here in Bellevue uh, pass from the scene? you got some good men here. You really do. 
we got a good man preaching word. What about when he's dead? What about when he's dead? What what if then all of us, as the as has been going on for some time, what if then the Lord didn't come back for another thousand years and all of us then are gone? And we then prepared another generation so that they're not like Israel of old that Amos was preaching to, but that the next generation and the third generation and the generation after that are going to be preaching the same gospel truths that are being preached from this pulpit right now with the same zeal and fervor and energy that you're going to find in congregations like Bellevue and others. We don't have that. We've got to start preparing and looking past. We've got to start looking past just our lives. We've got to th start thinking about the church generations from now. God help us to do that. Or we're going to be like Israel of old. And congregations are going to be, they're going to be gone. They're going to be lost. And we're few now, we'll be fewer. But I'll tell you what, these are exciting times for the Lord's church. They really are. And for such a time as this, you're in the kingdom of God. And if you're a mother or father, you make sure that your child is ready to do battle for the cause of Jesus Christ. If you're an elder, and you make sure the eldership is going to stand firm and fast and we're going to prepare and we're going to work until it's time for us to go on. And if you're a gospel preacher, you don't dare give up. You say, I'm going to keep on preaching and if they run me off from this place, that's all right. There's always plenty of Amosias. But you be the Amos and you keep right on preaching. Don't you then give up from discouragement and say, I'll never utter another word. Don't you do it. Souls are too precious. We need you. That's right. You're here for a time like this. Alright, let's rise up. Let's be faithful to our God. If you're not a Christian, would you obey the Gospel of Christ? Would you be baptized into Him? If you're a child of God and you've wandered away, why don't you come back? Why don't you come back right now and start living the way that you know you should? Remember where you were. Remember your obligations before heaven. Now, resolve within your mind, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to repent. I'm coming back to my God. Now do it. Let's stand.